All right, if I were to give a quiz today, I'm not, so you can breathe a little bit cooler, but if I, but if I were to give a quiz today, okay, what I would do is the following. It's that Bob and, it's a Bob and Sue problem. It's that Bob Okay, so why don't we try this? Why don't you just get out a sheet of paper and just try this and you get an idea of what I'm doing. So this is the kind of quiz I would give if I were to give a quiz today. I should write quiz on the top up there so the people walking in will have a <laughs> experience. Yeah, let's do that. Uh <laughs> So take out a sheet of paper and uh, work out this problem. <laughs> So I'll read it for you. Uh, there is a basketball game on January 16th, next Thursday. Bob believes that UCI will win and he'll give five to three odds. In other words, for every three dollars you bet with him, if UCI loses, he'll pay you five dollars. Sue believes the other way around, she gives three to two odds. That means for every two dollars you bet with her, if she loses, she pays you three. And you have a hundred dollars, find how to bet to ensure a maximum outcome no matter what happens in this game. Okay, folks, <clears throat> that's uh, an example. For those of you who came in late and are panicking, this is why I told the other part, uh, the people that got here in time, that this was a practice quiz, not a quiz. But that's about the type of a problem you can expect on a quiz, based on your homework, that if you've done your homework, you can whip through that thing in no time flat. If you haven't, you can't. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and give you the answer for this. Yes? You don't need calculators. Uh, you just write them down in funny forms, that's all. All right, now, why are we talking about gambling? The fact is that when you are investments, when you're making investments, you're gambling. Will Apple stock go up tomorrow or not? You don't know, that's a gamble. When you're looking at an investment beyond putting it in the bank or U.S. Treasury bond or something like that, you have no idea if you're going to win or if you're going to lose. And so what happens is that a good portion of finance is trying to understand that if you have a gamble, and you do if you're investing, there's no guarantees, if you have a gamble, how can I ensure, A, that I don't get hurt, I don't lose my home and everything else? How can I ensure that uh, I get the best possible deal? 
That's what we're going to be learning in this course. It's the mathematics of finance. We're going to be learning how to use the tools of mathematics to understand how to handle these issues. So here we have, I'm talking about, uh, so the easiest way to handle these things and introduce them, in my opinion, is to start off with simple gambles and to analyze what goes right and what goes wrong. So let's start with this one right here. I'm going to bet X dollars with Bob and I'm going to bet 100 minus X dollars with Sue. Sue. Now, if you did it the other way around, that's fine. You're going to get the same answer. The algebra will be a bit different, but you'll have the same answer. So now let's take a look if UCI wins. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my profit curve. Remember, no money changes hands. No money changes hands until after the game. Then you pay your debts and you collect your winnings. And as I stated in the notes, that's uh, very different than if you go to a gambling casino. So I'm going to lose if UCI wins. I am betting X dollars right here against winning. And I'm betting 100 minus X that UCI wins. So the profit curve over here is going to equal, I'm going to lose all the money that I bet with Bob. And I'm going to win money for each dollar that I bet with Sue. She's going to have to pay me three halves of a dollar. Two to one is the same thing as three halves to one. Three to two is the same as three halves to one. So this is going to be three halves 100 minus x. Everybody with me on that? So all I'm doing is writing down my losses and my victories. So when I collect the terms, it's going to be 100 and 50, 50, 3, 150, minus 3 halves, minus, minus 5 halves. And I want this to be greater than 0. And when will it be greater than 0? It will be greater than 0 when 150 ah, come on, is greater than 5 halves x, or when 60 5 goes into there uh, three times, no, 30, uh, 5 goes into here three zero, uh, 30 times 260, when 60 is less than x. Now, what I want to do is I want to find what happens if UCI loses. If UCI loses, I write down my profit curve and I lose all the money that I bet with Sue. I lose all the money that I bet with Sue because I bet with Sue that UCI is going to win and I win money from Bob. For each dollar I bet with Bob, I get five-thirds of a dollar back. Collecting the terms, this is equal to minus 100 plus eight-thirds x, 
and I want this to be greater than zero. That is, I want eight thirds to be greater than a hundred. That is, I want eight thirds x to be greater than a hundred. Eight thirds usually is not greater than a hundred. And so I solve for x, and I have that x has to be greater than 300 divided by 8. And so therefore, therefore to to find, uh, I want to have 300 over 8, which is about, what, um, less than $40, less than x, less than 60. So if I bet in this neighborhood right here, I am guaranteed money, no matter what happens. To find the maximum, I take the two profit curves and I set them equal. And what I'm going to have then is, that'll be 6, that'll be 16, 15, that'll be 31 over 6x is equal to 250. And I can just solve. <coughs> I get x is equal to 250 over 31 times 6. Leave your answer in that form right there. You don't need calculators. Just leave your answer in this form right here. See, faster than even getting out your little calculator to do some computation. And then I plug that into one of the profit curves to find how much money I'm going to make. Any questions? Let's go to a question that he asked last Tuesday. Where am I going to find a situation like this? Quite often. Quite often, folks. Whenever anybody has a strong belief one way or the other, on both sides, you have a situation of that type. Is the Apple stock going to go up or is the Apple stock going to go down? Some think it's going to go up, some think it's going to go down. And so what happens is, in, on the market, everywhere, you are going to find situations where the individuals have different beliefs. Where the individuals have different beliefs. Now, <clears throat> that's why we want... Yes? Yes, she asked, can we do this for situations involving more than two? The answer is absolutely. You have more equations. Because if I have, say, three people, I'm going to have to divide it. I'll give X dollars a bet with you, Y dollars with you, and I'll bet 100 minus X minus Y with, with him. If I do that, now I need two variables. I need two equations. So you have to find the second equation. And one of the problems in the notes is exactly of this type. So you can do it for as many as you would like. And it gets a little bit more. The algebra gets a little bit messier, but it's there. Okay? Any questions? Other questions? That's a good question. Yes? Um, is it necessary to do the bounds of x right there? No. <clears throat> not really. I do it just to make sure that I'm not going to have a situation as I have in the notes where no matter what you do, you're going to lose. Can we just like plug yeah. back in? Yeah, yeah, and check. Yeah, you can do that. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? So what we need then is what we have then. It's there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty involved in uh, on the market. To be honest, I don't care what discipline you're in. There's a lot of uncertainty. In finance, there's a lot of uncertainty. In engineering, there's a lot of uncertainty. In economics, oh gosh, uh, <laughs> nothing but uncertainty. And so that's why it is important 
to understand how do we handle uncertainty. You want to know the truth? We still don't have a complete answer. We do not have a complete answer. If you go to just the engineering uh, building, if you look at some of the engineering design, oh, look at those engineers. They can make all these beautiful cars and all that, that big propeller outside there and everything else. There is so much that's not known that they have an area called uncertainty analysis type things and decision analysis. There's so much uncertainty involved, they don't know how. So what I'm going to be doing is giving you just the fundamentals. But this is an area which is just ripe for some clever people to jump into and make nice contributions. So what we did is we started last time asking the question, what can I expect? Well, if you're talking about what can I expect, what, uh, you have to tell me what you're dealing with. Uh, how, how much money can I have? Uh, how much uh, um, free time will I have this weekend? Uh, anything else? And that's given by a random variable. It is a mapping from a sample space. We usually say into the real line, but it could be into whatever you want. What's a sample space? A sample space here. It's that UCI wins, UCI loses. There's two events in that sample space. All right? And so what happens then is if you're rolling a die, you got six sides, and so what happens when I roll a die? You got six sides, and so there's one, two, three, four, five, six. You got six possibilities that can crop up. I'm rolling two die, and I'm going to take the sum. Then you have all the answers from two to 12. And so what you do is we have all sorts of different sample spaces. The sample space, really just think of the sample space. You can uh, find definitions, but just think of the sample space really as just a space of events that are important to you. Now, to get some answers last time, we looked at a sample space that had two events. Heads, tails. And in this case, the random variable, the random variable is how much am I going to get if heads crops up? How much is going to, am I going to get if tails crops up? And the question is, what can I expect? That's always, if you're looking at finance in any type, you're constantly asking, you should be asking, what can I expect? Am I going to have enough to finish UCI? <laughs> Am I going to have enough to go off to graduate school? You're constantly talking about what can I expect on any investment? And because of that, you know immediately that this expected value that I'm going to talk about is going to keep cropping up. So the expected value is going to be how likely it's going to be how likely is an event times what am I going to get for that event plus how likely is an event times what am I going to get for that event. And you do so over all possible events. Very simple. Uh-oh. There's a problem. The problem is, is that large number of the problems coming from finance 
are not discrete. You don't have a finite number of possible events. You got an infinite number of them. Ouch. Never liked infinity anyway. Okay. One of my areas of research is mathematics of astronomy. You've, if you've had differential equations, you know, I think you have to have it to have this course, yes. So if you had differential equations, you know you have an initial condition and that tells you where the solution is going to go. So the probabilities are then over all possible initial conditions. Well, you know there's an infinite number of them from differential equations. So here's a problem. What's the likelihood that the sun and the earth were just going along on their own business and the moon happens by and the moon got captured? That the reason we have a sun, earth, moon system is that the moon was captured. So we would look over all initial conditions and we would find what's the likelihood that those initial conditions would lead you to capture. So that means that the problems we have here are far more complicated. That what we might have is what is known as a probability distribution function. Tells you how the probabilities are distributed, that's all. How in the heck am I going to find the expected value of this? Here's my, here's my function. Ah, oh, darn, how am I going to do this? How am I going to handle this? Well, what you do is you stumble for a while, look around for a while, pick up some of these and wonder where they came from for a while. Then you say, well, let's try to change this problem into one I know how to handle. To change this into a problem I know how to handle, I, I know how to handle this discrete problem, I don't know how to handle the continuous problem. So let's just break this into a large number of discrete problems. So what happens is here's the probability, the area under that curve, the area of that little curve will be the probability that something can happen. So what have I done? is I've taken this problem that I have no idea how to handle. This is just a function, f of p. At each point p, it tells you what is the probability. And I don't know how to handle that problem. But I know that if I write this now down into delta p, that I could write this as the summation of x of p times delta p, where delta p is the space, and f is going to be the height, excuse me, excuse me, f of p delta of p, that that's going to be the expected value. Let's go over that to make sure you understand it. What we have is I don't have probabilities, but this is my probability distribution function. And so in some sense, this right here, this area right here is an approximation for the probability when I'm trying to make it into a finite problem. So what is this? This term right here takes the role of pi in the expected value over here, which would be the summation of x of pi, pi. Okay, everybody with me on that? Who's not? Who's not sure but doesn't want to raise their hand? Who's a liar? <coughs> okay. okay, I'm going to assume you're, you're correct. So what I'm doing here is I have a probability, I have a random variable. I'm trying to mimic that equation over there. I don't know how to do it, so what I'm going to do is I say, well, here's the probability. In some sense, that probability has to be this height times that width, that height times that width. So here's my pi, and here's my random variable. How do I get a better answer? 
A sharper answer. Yeah? Uh, integral? Yeah, what happens is, you've all seen this equation. What happens is if I make these, these regions a little smaller, what's going to happen is I'm going to get a better estimate on the probability. So I want to find the best approximation for this, and that's going to be the integral of x of p, f of p, and that delta gets smoothed out to dp. So really that equation and this equation over here are exactly the same. One has smoothed out summation signs to get the integral sign and the other and gets rid of the deltas and puts in d's. Okay, let's try a couple problems. First problem. Problem one is my PDF. It's going to equal zero. If x is less than or equal to zero, it's going to equal cx. If zero is less than x, it's less than one. And it's going to equal zero if x is greater than one. That's my probability distribution function. It's going to give you the probabilities that certain events occur. Find C. Find the constant C. What do you get for C? Yep, two. And so let's see how they got that. The first question is, how am I going to solve that problem? I don't have enough information. Yeah, you do. What happens is we know from last time that the summation of the probabilities has to equal one. We also know that means in the continuous is that the summation of f of x dx has to equal 1. So this goes all the way from minus infinity to infinity. So what this means then is this becomes 1 is equal to the integral from minus infinity to 0 of 0 dx. That's this part right here. Plus the integral from 0 to 1 of, of cx dx. That's this part right here. plus the integral from 1 to infinity of 0 dx. Two of those integrals are easy. The integrals with 0 inside there are pretty darn easy. So this whole thing really breaks down to 1 equal c. Well, what is this? This is going to be x squared over 2 evaluated between 0 and 1 which is going to be equal to c times <clears throat> 1 squared over 2 minus 0 squared over 2, which is equal to <coughs> c over 2. 
And so therefore, solving for C, I see that C, I see that C is equal to 2. So I can change that now. Get a 2. Yes? Doesn't your PDF have to be continuous? No. No. Just has to be uh, greater than or equal to 0. Uh, uh, example might be where uh, I'm finding the probability of uh, driving along a certain road, but uh, I'm gonna, it's also the bridge is open. Oops, discontinuity. <laughs> okay. So no, you can have discontinuities and everything else. But this one is continu uh, piecewise continuous, and that's enough. So he's asking a question, does the probability distribution function have to be continuous? No. What you can do is you can have uh, a probability where what happens is uh, I'm going to roll a die and pick a number at random. Now you've got a combination between continuous and, uh, uh, and discrete. And the broader you uh, allow your PDF, the uh, more types of issues you can handle. All you need is that f is greater than or equal to zero. And that this integral is equal to one. That's all we need. This condition right here. All right, here's the random variable. My random variable, it's going to be, I'm going to give you x squared. You choose x equals 1 half, and I'm just going to give you 1 fourth. You choose x equals 1 fifth, I'm going to give you 1 over 25. x equals x squared. They expected uh, every x you get, the random variable will square it. Find the expected value. What is the expected number I can get? So remember what expected value is. In the discrete case, it is what will I get if pi occurs and how likely is pi? Or what will I get at event xi and what is the probability of xi? Same thing. And I sum over all the possibilities. That's all a, possi all a random variable is. I mean, expected value is. You look at what you're going to get. You find out how likely each other the events are and you sum them all up. That's all you're doing. And so what we're doing here is it's going to be the expected value of x is going to be, if I have a continuous, it's going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of x times the likelihood of x of x which is f of x dx. So it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Okay? And what we have here is we just substitute in I'm going to have a lot of zeros here, so this is going to reduce down to between 0 and 1 of x squared times 2x dx. And 
And this is going to break, break down into the very, very difficult problem of 2 times the integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed dx, which is equal to 2 over x to the fourth over 4, evaluated between 0 and 1, which is equal to 1 half. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, now what is the expected value whenever you've got data or anything like that? Think of the expected value as the average. You know, if you had a course in calculus and you had to find Where's that point, that middle point, the center of mass, where it's going to balance and everything like that? So think of the expected value as the middle point, as a center point, as a starting point from your data with respect to the random variable. But before I go on to the next point, do you realize that over this weekend, on Saturday, I biked 20. Nice. 20 what? Feet miles. <laughs> miles. Feet, inches, <laughs> kilometers. You don't know. It was more than 20 and it was miles. <laughs> but what happens is we don't know. Yeah. You've got a grade here. The grade, average grade for this x squared is one half. And you have one fourth. And how bad is that? How far is that away from one half? Inches, miles, kilometers? You don't know. So what we need is a measure of distance. We need a measure of distance. We need, we need to get a, some kind of a measure, some kind of a distance, some sort of a unit is what we need. Because this idea of going 20, oh, 20 what? <laughs> okay. So you have to make sense out of it. And it has to come from the data. Now, what have we learned from ninth grade on, or maybe it was eighth grade uh, on? We learned about distance. A, B, and the distance is C. And you want to find the distance C. And you say, well, to get this distance here, if I know this distance and this distance, I can find that. C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. Pythagorean theorem. Or... If I'm in three space, and I have a point up here, I want to find out what's its distance. So the point here is 4, 1, 6. You know how to find the distance of that. That'll be 4 squared plus 1 squared plus 6 squared, the square root of it. So what we have then is a natural way, if we borrow from physics, a natural way of finding distance is to use the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared plus C squared equals D squared, or whatever you want. So how am I, blah, 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 how am I going to define distance of a random variable? Standard deviation. Hmm? Standard deviation. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm going to find it in a second. What I'm going to do to find a distance is I need a, I need a, darn, I, I, I need a base point. Oh, I've got one. I've got one. It's called the expected value. Here's my base point. That's the middle point. That's the average. We just got through talking about that. So I need a base point to measure my data. 
So that's a number. Okay, so now what do I need is I need x of x. How far does my data in each of these directions, how far does it differ from my base point? That'll be my a distance. The next one will be my b distance. Next one will be my c distance. And so what am I going to do? is it's going to be a squared plus b squared plus c squared type, so I'm going to square this. And now I need to sum. I need to sum. Well, if I ever, am I ever going to use summation where we have unlikelihood, I have to put in the probability. And I have to sum. So this is nothing more than your a squared plus b squared equals c squared, except risk data. That's all it is. And it's going to be a distance. Well, it's not going to be a distance. It's going to give me c squared, so it's going to be distance squared. So that's going to be called a variance. And so then the distance the distance will be the square root of the variance, and that will be the standard deviation. Notice, nothing mysterious about this at all. Nothing mysterious at all. All we are doing is just simply saying, hey, I need some sort of a unit that I can use for measurement. Kilometers or miles or something. And so therefore we invent one. And where are we going to get it? We're going to get it right from the Pythagorean theorem of a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's where we're going to get it. And so that's all I'm doing here. I need a space, a place to measure from. That's our expected value. So this is the expected value. Here is how it's going in one direction. Square it and just sum them. And I'm going to get then what is called a variance. And the variance is going to then give me information about distance squared. And so the distance is going to be equal to the square root of it or the standard deviation. Find the variance of that x squared problem that we looked at already. So remember here, here is my PDF, my probability distribution function. Here is my x of x equals x squared. I want you to compute the variance of x. Okay, the variance of x is going to be equal to the integral of, and just use common sense again, we're going to be integrating over everything possible. We're going to be seeing how much does something deviate from the expected value. Where, what was expected value? I lost that. That was one, one half. Was it one half? Yeah, it was. One half squared. So I want to know how much is my data deviating from this. That'll be like a squared plus b squared plus c squared. And I have to weight it according to the probability distribution function. And so what we know is we can get rid of a good portion of this range because this is zero for a lot of it. That's the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared minus 1 half squared times 2x dx.
And now what we want to do is I need to square that. Oh, I hate squaring. Um, I'm going to get x to the fourth minus, what's, what am I going to get next? Uh, minus x squared plus one fourth all times 2x dx. And now I'm going to, uh, now I'm going to integrate this again. 0 to 1 of 2x to the fifth minus 2x cubed plus uh, 1 half x dx. And you integrate it, and you get your answer. Okay. Let me ask some questions. Suppose the variance is very small. What does that mean? That what? Okay. If the, what does it mean? Anybody else want to help? You should get the correct answer, but yeah. Yeah, it means the values just from the definition, just from the definition that if the variance is very, very small, this number right here has to be small, so all the data has to be hanging around the expected value. If the variance is large, means it's all spread out. Where will I see variance? in the market. Where will I see variance in the market? Why? I mean, in other words, who gives a damn about variance is what we want to know. Volatility. Hmm? Uh, the volatility. Okay. One of the places we're going to see it is we see the stock prices. You look at the stock at the end of the day, the stock market. And it doesn't go like this, it goes like that, right? Jumping all over the place. The jumping all over the place is going to be the variance. It's going to be measured by the variance in the market. And so the variance is going to tell you whether, as we're going to discover, whether it's wise to put money in the market or not. And how that's going to tell you something about the risk involved in going into the market. So the variance turns out to be very important. And in fact, they hire large numbers of people with good mathematical skills and computer skills to try to figure out new ways of computing the variance and various other issues that crop up in the market. Pay them quite well. All righty. What I want to do now is I have a random variable want to put away your um, yeah I have a random variable and how am I going to measure it how do I measure a random variable what's a way of measuring it well, how far is it away from its expected value? Is it above or below? Did I get above the class average or below the class average on a test? So a way to, ran, uh, to handle a random variable is to find out are you above average or below average? The next question is how far above or below average am I? How far did I drive? Uh, did I go this weekend? Well, in terms of miles or in terms of kilometers? 
So to divide by the distance, we put divided by sigma. So what does this tell me? <coughs> this tells me my data is either above or below the average. And if the number here is two, it means it's two units above or two units below. Where have you seen this? You've all seen this. Where? Yes, right. You get those on your uh, SAT scores. You see those on your IQ scores. You see them on all sorts of scores. What do they do? This is called Z, usually. And so what do they want? Well, let's say, let's suppose I want um, intelligence to be, um, intelligence to be average to be at 100. So you add 100 to it. And suppose I want a standard deviation so that a genius is 140 and a nimisole is at uh, 60. What I'll do is I'll multiply it by 20. For the SATs, you use 1,000. No, not 1,000, 500. I don't know what you use. I haven't looked at an SAT in I don't know. <laughs> Longer, before they were even born yet. Okay. <laughs> so what happens, though, is you just modify your z-score in whatever way you want to get the uh, different information. So the IQ often is, average IQ is 100. So if I'm going to get 100, I want Z equal to 0. I want the average IQ, Z will equal 0. So I put 100 here. To be two standard deviations above, to be called a genius, that's all a genius is. It means you did well on a test. It doesn't mean anything else. It means I want, when this number is 2, I want to get 140. And so I just multiply it by 20. And so a large number of the different evaluation scores you see in the literature are just these z-scores modified to make them look nice. Any questions on anything? We've covered a, quite a bit of statistics and probability. I think a lot of you have seen at least some of it before. So this is a review. Now let's go to a problem which crops up constantly in finance and in economics. How to use information to your advantage. There's a whole area out there which was developed, oh, let me try to remember, in about the mid 80s and really coming to strong power today called auction theory. How do I design an auction so I can get the most out of it? I'm going, let's, let's take a look at that right here. I'm going to put this thing, this, oh, you don't realize, this is gold plated. I'm going to put this up for auction. What are you going to bid? $20. $20, you? $10. $10, oh, he's ahead. What about you? Dollars. Dollar. Dollar, <laughs> what about you? 25, okay. So that's our standard auction. Are there any other auctions you could use? Uh, the Dutch. The Dutch? Okay. What's that? You lower the right. price and okay. they say it's okay for me. Yeah, okay. $100. Who wants this for 100 99 Who wants this for 99 98 97 Which one is best to get the most money out of this? Which one? The one that, um, the first one. First one. Actually, neither. The one that's best is the one that says, how am I going to extract the information about you? You're, see, what you did is when you said 25, you really wanted to have it for 30. But you said 25 because you thought you could get it for 25. <laughs> okay. And if we were going down, you were saying, well, yeah, no. What I'm going to do is I think I'm going to try to outweigh somebody. <clears throat> so how am I going to create an auction? where you will be honest, not trying to be uh, manipulative. And a Nobel Prize was awarded for that. It's called a Vickery auction. Or you can write down second best auction. 
what is the second best auction? You write down how much you want, how much you're willing to pay. You write down how much you're willing to pay for this. The high bid wins, but they don't pay what they bid. They bid the second, they pay the second high bid. So if I think this is, she thinks this is worth $30, she writes down 30. He writes down 25. She wins. But she, because she wrote down the highest amount, 30. But she only pays $25 to get it. The second high bid. And why is that the best? Well, there's, if she thinks it's worth 30, there's no way she's going to say $31. He might come in 30.5 and she has to pay more than she thinks it's worth. And there's no way she's going to say $29 because he might come in and say $29.50 and then she loses it. So what happens in these types of auctions and things, it's that you really have to pay attention to what kind of information are you getting, what kind of information are you giving out. A lot of that comes from probability. And it comes from looking at problems in a different way. The example which I gave in the notes, it's that you're looking at, you're going to a family, and they have Two, two children. I don't know what they are. I don't know if they're a boy, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, girl, boy. I have no idea. So let's take a, assume that each one is born 50-50 chance. So what is the sample space? The sample space is equal to a boy is born first, a boy is born second, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, girl. And we're going to assume they're all like the same likelihood. So therefore the probability of a boy, boy is one for, uh, fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. Okay, everybody with me on that? Sums to one, equal likely. Alrighty. What happens then is I go to the door and a sweet little girl comes out. And she says, hi, I'm Anna. Would you like to come in? What's the probability that the other child is a girl? So you got information. Well, in that auction, I'm talking about how do you use information to see how probabilities change. What is the likelihood that the other child is a girl? One half. Okay. Well, let's see what that would be. We know that this can't be true. Can't be both boys. This could be true, this could be true, or this could be true. So how often do, so therefore my sample space now becomes here. With the information, my sample space changes. And so what's the likelihood of a girl being the other child? It's going to be two-thirds, yeah, uh, two-thirds, right. There's three things here, and two of them, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, one-third, 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 you're right, one-third. Because we know that in this case, this case, this case, so it's one-third. Now you come to the door, but let's throw that one out. Suppose you go to the door, and instead of a nice, sweet little Anna coming to the door, you got a snotty little kid. And a snotty little kid says, Go away. I don't like you. I don't like anybody. And I'm the youngest, and so I get my way all the time. You've all had siblings like that, haven't you? Or maybe you were the sibling. Okay. <laughs> but the question is, now what's the probability? Mm -hmm. 
Now what's the probability? Uh -huh. Now it's changed, right? And the reason it changed is I'm the youngest. And by being the youngest, we now know that the sample space is something else. That the sample space is either here or here. The youngest is the second born, and so it's either here or here, and so there's a 50-50 chance of the other child being a boy or a girl. So slight information. And remember, our goal in this class is to try to develop your intuition so that you can be successful. It's not to get you through the course, but so that you can be successful beyond the course. Slight information, which seems to be slightly different than what you had otherwise, can make a very big difference in the probabilities. Difference in probabilities means difference in whether or not you're going to win or lose. Okay? And so that is the point there. Any questions on this? So throughout the course, we're going to be paying attention on where information can change likelihoods. Yes? All right, so let's suppose, so what we have here, it's that, oh, if a boy came to the door? No, a girl came to the door. A little snotty girl came to the door. And she said, I don't like you and I don't like anyone. I'm a young girl and I'm the youngest in the family and I get my way all the time. Okay? And so therefore, what's the sample space? It has to involve a girl as the youngest, so it could be this. Or it could be this. It could be only those two. That's the only thing it could be. No, order of birth. It's the order of birth is what I stated. So therefore, BG is a boy was born first, a girl second, so the girl is the youngest. Oh, duh. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's where we have there. Now, what I want to do next is to tell you, I want to brag to you, I really want to brag to you, that right here, in my hand, I am holding a vintage Mickey Mantle trading card. Really, a vintage Mickey Mantle <coughs> trading card. It's worth a hundred bucks on the market. And what happens is, you might want to buy it. But wait a minute, should he buy it now or should he wait for a while? I mean, after, maybe wait till the end of the quarter, find out what the course was like or something like that and decide whether he can earn enough money to buy it or not. So what he's going to do is he's going to get a contract. It's a legal, uh, uh, it's very legal then, so he can go to court to enforce it. It's a contract. And what he's going to do is that the contract is going to have a, it is the ability the ability to buy. So he can come to me and he say, I want to buy that Ricky Mantle card. I have no choice. It's a contract. I have to sell it to him. Because I went into the agreement with him. So he can call me and say, I want it. And so it's called a call. And we're going to say that the stock price or the this is going to be the price, like a dollar sign, the price of my Mickey Mantle card on the market. But the call <coughs> has a specified amount of money on it. 
So in this case, what it does is it has, number one, it is a contract, ability to buy. Number two, what it is, is it has a specified amount. He wants to be able to buy that card for me for $100. And what happens is we have an expiration date. And this will be March 14th at the end of the quarter. So what we have is a contract. The contract, he doesn't have to buy it. The contract is he can buy it. If he wants to, I've got to sell it to him. So he's going to call me and say, I want to buy it, and I've got to sell it to him. And I've got to sell it to him for $100. That's the contract. Okay? Now, what happens is, let's take a look and see whether on March 14th, whether or not he's going to exercise his contract. So suppose on March 14th, the price of a Mickey Mantle card is now down to $98. Is he going to exercise that contract? Nah. Not at all, because what he can do is buy a Mickey Mantle card for $98, but if he exercises the contract, he has to pay me 100 He has to buy it for 100 So that would be silly. <coughs> what if it's, uh, the current price for a Mickey Mantle card is 120 He'll jump at it. In fact, he can make money right away, whether he likes baseball or not. He can buy it from me for 100 and I've got to sell it. That's the contract. I've got to sell it to him for 100 and then he can resell it for 120 go home or $20 in his pocket. So draw the profit curve for a call. Draw a profit curve for this call right here. Go ahead. Okay, what happens is the profit for the call, here's 100, the strike price, this is called the strike price, it's 100. If it is less than 100, if it is less than 100, he's going to forget that I even exist. And so he gets nothing. If it's 101, he's going to exercise it because he gets a dollar profit. If it's 102, he's going to get a $2 profit. If it's 120, he's going to get a $20 profit. So therefore, the profit curve is going to look like this. This is one of the financial instruments that we will be studying the whole quarter. So I want you to be really sure that you understand it. Now, why would I enter into a legal contract with him where I, he has all the options and I have nothing? What do you think? Why would I get into that contract with him? Other than being stupid. Insurance? Okay, possibly insurance. What about you? Um, well, if it wasn't a card, it was something else, like a business. Maybe he's losing money, so he just wants 
Okay. So we have all of those. But, the, but I am a selfish person. I'm doing it only because I am going to charge him a price for it. I'll go in this contract, but you've got to pay me five bucks for this contract. So what happens is, here is the profit curve now. The blue line. Because what happens is that he had to pay me five bucks for that curve. What was he thinking to get the call? What, what was he thinking to, to get into this contract? Okay. Yeah. So he's thinking that the price is going to go up. He believes the price is going to go up. And what am I thinking? I'm thinking it's not going to go up. I'm thinking it's not going to go up at all. Because what happens is, I'm thinking that the price is going to go down. If the price goes down, I just have my five bucks. He has nothing, etc. So, when we look at the advantages and disadvantages of a call, and we're going to really get into that uh, starting next Tuesday, and on a put, you have to figure out who is, whose advantage is it, whose disadvantage is it. If I'm willing to sell him a call, I think the price is going to go down. He thinks the price is going to go up. He has limited risk, five bucks. I have unlimited risk. It could go up to $2,000 and I'd lose $1,900. Please sit down. Wait a minute, we're not through yet. So what happens is, what you want to do is you want to look at who has the risk, who has the advantage on any of these things. And I will be going around class asking you for each of these things t next time. But what happens is, when you know that, we're going to be then begin to understand how to hedge how to find arbitrage, how to do everything else. Okay, that's it. See you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend.